director at the American Alpine Club. And it's amazing to have so many rock climbers in the room. You guys look fabulous. This is incredible. Um, we've had a wonderful day on the hill. We have had 62 climbers going around Capitol Hill taking meetings. We've done 60 meetings today, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, a number of those have been with members. And we've had some good successes. Um, Senator Angus King today told us he was going to um, co-sign on the Recreation Not Red Tape Act. That's something we've been all working on, so that's awesome. Um, so um, this afternoon, we're going to hear from some of our professional climbers. And um, we're very lucky we have a very special guest here this afternoon. Senator Cantwell has joined us. She is first and foremost a rock climber. She, as far as we're concerned, she's climbed Rainier. She's climbed Kilimanjaro. She's climbed the Grand Teton. And she does some amazing work for us. She is, um, she is the ranking member on the Energy and Natural Resource Committee, which is the committee that oversees public lands. Um, and she is the primary sponsor of the Land Water Conservation Fund bill to fully um, fund it and permanently reauthorize it. So thank you, Senator. Um, there we go. So, Senator Canwell, please come on up. We'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you, Maria, and thank you for um, inviting everyone to come and be a part of this. This reminds me of the uh, afternoon on a Thursday when I went downstairs to the uh, cafeteria to get something, and there was a huge line. And I said to the young woman in front of me, I said, why is there such a big line? And she says, well, you know, when all the senators run to catch airplanes, the staff come down here to get refreshed. <laughs> so today is about us getting refreshed. So thank you all for being here and participating in what is what I call my kind of a hearing. Um, I want to say a special thanks to everybody who's helped organize today, the American Alkine Club and the Access Fund. And, uh, you know, many of you know that we just had a memorial in Seattle for Fred Becky. Um, and many of you have probably seen the famous sign that he had in the photograph, we'll belay for food. Mm -hmm. So the people that here are, you're going to hear from today have the kind of passion and humor that climbing is all about. And they're going to share with us, so I'm not going to talk long because I want to stay for as much of it as I possibly can. But we're here also to say that the outdoor economy is an economic juggernaut, that it's $887 billion of consumer spending and that we want to see more of that. Jobs in tourism, hotels, outdoor gear, and food on the table for families. So yes, Congress needs to get it right, and we need to continue to protect our public lands and our special places. So I won't be surprised if you see a picture of somebody at Bears Ears. But as was Maria just said, the Land and Water Conservation Fund needs to be reauthorized this year. We need to have this vital tool for all of us. And so I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Uh, I wanted to say a special hello to Lynn uh, Hill, who's also here from Seattle, who did the f first free climb of El Capitan. Thank you. Sorry I didn't get to join you in Seattle, but thank you so much. But I don't know, I don't know how to say how excited I am that Alex Arnold Tommy Caldwell, Mika Bernhardt, Caroline uh, uh, Gallic, uh, Sasha DeJulian uh, are all here to give you a wonderful, wonderful presentation. As I said, this is what I wish every congressional briefing was all about. So thank you all very much. We're going to go in order. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Phil Powers with the American Alpine Club. Uh, we're going to hear from our athletes now. I think we're going to begin with Tommy. Does that work for you, Tommy? Yeah. Begin with you. Tommy, uh, I've known for a long, long time. I climbed a lot with his father, climbed a little bit with him when he was young, and I could keep up with him like when he was eight. Uh, but you'll, you'll recognize Tommy as... Uh, 
a phenomenon who both did the first ascent, the first free ascent of the Don Wall, perhaps the hardest big wall climb in the world, but he also is an alpine climber. He's also a world traveler, and he's also a father. So without further ado, Tommy Caldwell. Thank you so much. Um, first thing I want to say is thank you to Senator Cantwell. I think for all the, the reasons that we're here, she is our major champion, um, the one doing the most. And man, I was here for a, a LWCF event a few months ago, and that was kind of the realization of all that you're doing to champion our causes that we believe in. So thank you so much. Second thing is, Alex, what's up, dude? Like, so typical. <laughs> I don't, typical Claire, I don't, I don't know what happened to that guy. Um, so anyways, I thought I would start today um, talking about my dad. Um, I grew up as a climber. My dad was a mountain guide, and he was also a middle school teacher. And he had this pretty amazing vision that he believed, he taught at a pretty, like one of the poorer school districts in all of Colorado, in Loveland, Colorado. And there was a lot of drug and gang issues at the school. And he believed that he needed to provide an, an alternative for these students, um, like, like an alternative form of excitement for these students. And so he organized this whole climbing program at the school. Um, he, would, he built a climbing wall was the first thing that he did. And then the students who kind of did the best on the climbing wall or were the most interested in them, he would set up these rope systems and do these very scary things in the gymnasium of the climbing gym. People would be jumping off beams and it appealed to the kids in this unbelievable way. And within, a, within a few years, this became the most, the most popular sport at his middle school. Um, and I, luckily, this was the same time that I was a middle schooler. I went to that same middle school. And um, I was a pretty small, shy kid, <laughs> a little different than I am now. But he used climbing and the outdoors to kind of breathe confidence in me. And it was a pretty good idea. It took me a lot of years to really appreciate how um, important that was. And you know, I think one thing that I realized is that um, the best way to get to know people and to fall in love is to actually go out and do something scary with people. Um, so my dad was doing this from you know really young age with me, um, but you know it's kind of been my whole life. It's a pretty good dating tip too, actually. The best way to get to fall in love with people is to do something scary with them. Um, this photo is actually in Bears Ears National Monument in Indian Creek. I'm taking a 40 foot whipper there, so doing something pretty scary. Um, at this time and through my whole childhood, I thought climbing was a very niche sport. You know, we were counterculturalists. There was not many of us. We didn't have any influence um, beyond, you know, our very small community. But um, a few years ago, I changed my ideas of that a little bit. The whole climbing gym revolution was taking over. Um, I was just going out and climbing like I normally do on El Capitan and this huge media event happened and it, it blew up without any pre-planning. We did not intend this to happen, but the New York Times ended up running articles about you know, a climbing adventure um, for seven days and it was like 13 billion media impressions and I was all of a sudden like, wow, people climb, people love <laughs> this sport. There's a lot of us out there and suddenly we have power to make change. You know, We have power and so how should we use that? We should use it to make change. And so that's when I got into lobbying work, and I started to realize that the, um, that the outdoors are unbelievably beloved. Um, I wrote a book, and I did a book tour last year, and it was interesting. I would stand up on these, um, on these stages at my book tour events, and they're all packed houses, which was so crazy to me for climbing events. You know, people would come out, and my publisher was like, we've never had events with this many people at them. And I'm like, really, for a climbing book? <laughs> That's pretty cool. But I would give my event, and then I would always give a little plug to Bears Ears, and I would get more cheers about, um, you know, at that part. That was like the, the most highly celebrated part of my presentations. And people really, really value their public lands, I think. Through the whole campaign that the Access Fund, the Alpine Club, and Patagonia did, there were 2.8 million comments, I think 98% in favor of saving Bears Ears National Monument. And so, um, I think it, and I think it's just beginning. I think this is a tidal wave that is starting. Being outdoors is cool. Going on adventures appeals to everyone. 
And so this is going to be influencing voting more and more in the future. And um, I'm feeling very optimistic about the future of our public lands. Um, I thought I'd end really quickly. Um, my wife and I are trying to raise our kids much in the same way that <laughs> I was raised. <laughs> we take them climbing. Um, we believe that the outdoors are our best teachers. And I want them to fall in love with climbing the way that I did, or with the outdoors. It doesn't necessarily have to be climbing, you know, <laughs> the same way I did. Um, and it's pretty cool, even for a five-year-old. This is my son right now. This picture was taken a couple weeks ago. <laughs> He's five years old. And um, I asked him the other day um, what he wanted to be in when he grew up, grew up, and he told me that he wanted to be an inventor. And I asked him what he wanted to invent, and he said he wanted to invent a boat that would clean the oceans. And, you know, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty cool thing to hear, and I think that is because we are taking him out in the world. He knows, he intimately knows what nature is like. We had, my wife started an organization called the Little Explorers Club, and we take groups of kids outside, and we look at bugs, and we climb on the rocks, and they know, they know the world. They know nature, and they want to protect it, even, even as a five-year-old. And so that's why this work that we're doing is so important. It's not just about climbing. It's about you know, saving, the, saving the planet for the future. So thank you guys so much. At, folks at the back, there are a lot of seats up front, so feel free to dodge that camera or walk down the side aisle and, and make your way to the front. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd love it if you could get a little closer to these heroes of ours. Um, uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Micah Burhart, who not only is a professional climber and a social media phenomenon, but... Uh, a tenacious climber in her own right that is back at the top of her game after having twins just less than two years ago. So let's hear it for mom. All right, I think, oh, where are me? All right, great, so I'm Micah, and as Phil said, I'm a pro climber, I'm a social entrepreneur, and I'm also a public land advocate. So how do those things fit together? Whoa, we're going to Sasha now. That's okay, we'll go, we went forward. So let me tell you a story. A couple, a, while, a couple years back, I sat down at my kitchen table. It was a rainy day in the fall. I had a few phone calls to make. So first person to answer my phone was Mary. I didn't know Mary, I still don't know Mary, but she answered the phone after 27 minutes on hold with Cigna Healthcare. I was calling Cigna to do what everybody does, is to change their address. So Mary and I went through the rigmarole. I validated my current address, Boulder, Colorado. I told her my new street, my new house number, my new town, and then my new state. And then Mary gasped. New Hampshire? You're moving to New Hampshire from Colorado? Arnie at Verizon was next. He was much more chatty than Mary. He's like, ma'am, I can't let you do that. Nobody does that. <laughs> I learned that Arnie was from Irving, Texas. I asked him if we were going to have a problem. He guaranteed me we weren't, so long as I told him why. I sighed, and I realized I was going to have to tell Arnie the truth. I grew up in Minnesota. I grew up paddling skiing, hiking. That was my expression in the outdoors. And I loved it. When I grew up, I said to everybody that all I wanted to do was either be a full-time climber or I wanted to run the UN. So it's all appropriate that here we are on <laughs> the hill right now. But being a climber quickly overrode all of those other impulses to be involved in politics, to run the UN, so to speak. I literally told people that. which I was totally a pain in the butt when I was young. And most people who know me here would say I probably still am. Um, but, you know, when I became a full-time climber, and at that point I was an AMJ certified rock guide, I decided to move to Colorado as an adult because that's where you go do those things, right? You move to Colorado, it has, it's how you have access, it's how you get outside, it's how you make a living. And I spent a bunch of time in my life traveling around the world and especially around the US exploring places as a climber. But here's the thing, I have to be totally honest, back then I thought that the places to explore the US as a climber all started in the Rockies and went west, right? because that's the US, that's where you want to be as a climber. Except 10 years after moving to Colorado, my first book came out, I was on a book tour, and also climbing, and I went east. I went to this place. I went to Crawford Notch State Park in New Hampshire, and I experienced some of the best ice climbing I've ever done in the US. And I thought, holy cow, what have I been missing for all these years? What if there's a whole nother landscape 
of exploration, of possibility that I didn't even give a chance to. And it was through that time that, like, I have this dirty little secret to tell you about climbing, which is, as climbers, we never talk about all the time we spend climbing when we're not climbing, which is an incredible amount of time, right? Like, you're belaying. If you're ice climbing, you're constantly moving. You're trying to keep warm. You're in a tent on a big expedition because it's raining. Or you're in a tent on a big expedition because you have a horrible blister between your pinky toe and your next toe, which happened to me and shut me down for a week, right? And you're thinking, I'm supposed to be this amazing climber, and here I am totally shut down by this blister. So all this time you have not climbing as a climber, you got to think. And that's a good thing because you start thinking about, like, well, what else am I doing in the world? How am I contributing to this world? How am I actually making it a better place? And for me, all the time I've spent in the U.S., in our public lands, seeing that intersection of conservation hand in hand with responsible use has inspired me to advocate for the same in my work that I do in Africa. So it's the Mountain of Muli in Mozambique. I led an expedition there in 2011 and in tw then in 2014, bringing scientists up onto the granite face to find new species of ants and beetles and frogs and skinks and snakes and started a movement actually right now in global mountaintop conservation um, through an organization I founded called Legato. And it, you know, for me, that all comes from this place. This is Whitehorse Ledge, um, right next to Cathedral Ledge where I live um, in New Hampshire. And you can look over my shoulder when I'm climbing and I can see houses. And I can see my house if I tried hard enough. And the thing is that when I grew up, I thought the outdoors meant being outside and being away from everything. Right? Like it was the answer to the city. It was the answer to DC. Like get out of it, get away from it. But as you know, and actually when I was about 18, I was on an expedition in the Arctic paddling for 45 days. And we were paddling along, and all of a sudden we saw these dots on the horizon, and we go through what you go through in the Arctic. You're like, is it a grizzly bear? Is it a musk ox? Is it a caribou? And then all of a sudden you're like, no, those look like people. And all I wanted to do was to keep paddling. Because I, I wrote in my journal that night that we saw people that day and they ruined my wilderness experience. <laughs> Right? I was like, no, 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 I haven't taken a shower for 30 days and I haven't seen people and now how do I, oh wait, you live here. Still, it's, I, I didn't want to see you. I wanted this to be my wilderness. And you know, by living out in the East Coast, I've seen this different in, um, interpretation of public lands and public lands that are hand in hand with livelihoods, Pub public lands that are hand in hand with community use, public lands that are hand in hand with protecting an ecosystem. And that's where I think we really can lean in and actually get, garner more support and garner more people to come to the middle of the table and have these conversations about how we keep public lands alive, as Tommy's saying, for next generations, for all of us to play on, but for all of us to also understand that they intersect every part of our lives, our livelihoods, our morals, our beliefs, the air that we breathe, and also how we want to make a difference in the world. These days, like I said, I do that um, mainly in Africa. So I travel, I'm the head of an organization. We work full time in Mozambique right now and we're about to expand. Uh, you know, and we work preserving remote mountain rainforest conservation hand in hand with the communities who call them home. Why the heck do I think that's a good idea? Because I see it happening all the time here in the US. I see it happening through grassroots initiatives um, that get, you know, where people get together in their backyards and protect their own landscapes all the way down to how we respond to national monuments, to how we declare new national parks. And that's a model that the U.S. has a huge heritage of, and we have a lot of, we have a lot at stake protecting that so that we continue to be global ambassadors of it. And all that came because I let public lands change the course of my head, my heart, and my plan. This guy also came with the East Coast. I'm not going to, you know, discount the fact that I met him when I came East. And uh, I explained all that to Arnie on the phone. But not, re not really all of it. I was like, hey, Arnie, so here's the deal. The land changed the course of my life. I fell in love with it and all it had to offer. And Arnie changed my address. That guy, Peter, and I got married. We had twins, as Phil mentioned. Uh, we live in New Hampshire. Uh, and I spend every day either climbing at home in New Hampshire or around the world trying to nudge that intersection closer between adventure and stewardship and what they mean for real life applications. So here's to our, oh, there's another slide. Anyway, I was going to say, here's to our public lands. You never know when one visit might change the rest of your life. We're, uh, we're hearing from a few of these athletes today, but I want to uh, make note of the fact that there are many more in the room. Um, for example, Quinn Brett. Quinn, are you here? Have you made it here yet? 
Oh, she's also stuck in traffic. And is Libby stu stuck in traffic too? Lib Libby Sauter is here as well. Uh, I want to point out that uh, Mikhail Martin is here. Mikhail, have you made it over? <laughs> Bethany Leibowitz. Uh, amazing all-around climber, Chelsea Rood is here. <laughs> Alina Zagatova, who just climbed Mount Everest last spring, is here. Uh, a young woman who I've just been blown away by, Margot Hayes, is here. <laughs> Margot has done some of the hardest climbs in the world. Uh, and another person who's been a hero of mine for a long, long time, Lynn Hill, who, who uh, did the first free ascent, and Senator Cantwell mentioned this, of El Cap so many years ago, I won't mention it. Lynn. <laughs> I want to bring up another hero of mine uh, who not only has been uh, a champion in the indoor competition scene, but has taken that drive and motivation and skill and prowess outside and accomplished some of the hardest climbs in North America and around the world, and then has gone on to become one of the most well-spoken, uh, uh, outgoing, and charismatic uh, people in our world. I was on a team with her at Climb the Hill last year, and I know that the future of advocacy in climbing is in good hands when it's in hands like those of people like Sasha DeJulian. Thank you, Phil, so much for that introduction. And thank you, Senator Canwell, for being here. And everyone here, I mean, listening to my team today, I was just so inspired to be on a team of people who just care so much about our sport and about the future of our community and our environment. And, well, I'm sorry, I don't have slides for you today. I just wanted to share my experience in climbing and what I've come to believe is why we should protect our public lands so heavily. Um, I grew up here in Washington, D.C., which is maybe surprising for some of you coming from an outdoors background. I think I love hearing of stories of how Tommy's child is growing up in the outdoors. Um, but I, I think what's really interesting to note is that we can grow up anywhere around the world and still have access to climbing at our fingertips. I went climbing at my brother's birthday party when I was six. That's how I got into the sport. And I honestly didn't really know anything about climbing at the time. It was just something that I really loved to do. It was like this simple desire to climb on top of things and that enjoyment of this really elemental existence of being there and being present that just kept me wanting to go back to climbing junior team practice. And shortly after that, the next year, I started competing and finding out more that climbing was an actual sport. But when I look back to the memories that I had as a kid and what really was gravitating to me about climbing was these experiences that I had outside and growing up to pictures like Lynn Hill climbing the nose and Tommy climbing every hard climb that there is. <laughs> and there is this gravitational pull to be out there in the environment and be exploring and enjoying this, this nature with my friends and with, with my coaches and with my community. And I think that over the years, I competed and I climbed in predominantly sport climbing up until a few years ago. And what I, what I really learned from traveling to over 40 different countries was that something that I was really proud of when I went outside of the US and people asked me about where I come from was our lands. And that's something that we can boast above many other countries. And I think that that's something as well that attracts foreigners to the places that we inhabit. And 
as climbers, as enthusiasts for the outdoors, what we notice in these places is that we could be in Yosemite or we could be in Devil's Tower and we see people speaking all sorts of different languages. And as climbers, we have this innate sort of key to recognize who's climbers and who's not a climber, just based on are they wearing a harness? Do they look like they're preparing to scale some cliff? And oftentimes, the people speaking another language don't have anything to do with climbing. But they're there. They've traveled thousands of miles from where they've come from to be there sharing our spaces. And I think that that, as Americans, is something that we need to really recognize as something to cherish and to not sacrifice. And the important thing to note as well is that once we give up these lands, once we lose that, there's no turning back. And that's why we appreciate the government leaders who are really stewards of the environment. And everyone in this room is, is really in a humbling, very amazing way doing their part. So thank you for having me here. What's the speed record on El Cap? Two hours, seven minutes. Two hours, 17 minutes. What was the one before that? What's, what's Alex's fastest time? Yeah, so that's kind of lame. I mean, just like <laughs> six or seven minutes off the record. Uh, we're going to take a quick break because it's taking Alex longer to get from the Department of the Interior to here than it takes him to climb El Cap. We're going to take a quick, a little intermission. I know people are busy. If you have to move on, move on. If you can stick around, stick around. We've got two more speakers. They'll be here shortly. I'll bring, bring Brady Robinson up to introduce them when they arrive. Thanks. <laughs> 